Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Snell, and Diana called me this afternoon and asked me to fill in for her and give the introduction. She um, is is unwell, quite unwell today, so didn't quite feel up to it. So I know we all wish her the best for a speedy recovery. So, uh, as I say, good afternoon and welcome. In case you aren't aware, today is Shakespeare's 458th birthday. Although he did write two sonnets which mention the healing waters, there is unfortunately no definitive proof that he ever was in Bath. But Britons do have a, another writer just as famous, Jane Austen, who was here from 1801 to 1806. And although she was rather glad to leave our beautiful city, her legacy still brings people from across the world to see places where she lived and learn about her life. Our speaker this afternoon, David Richardson, began his career as a university administrator, but he has been a distinguished member of the Jane Austen Society for almost 50 years, writing and speaking to groups on a regular basis. For seven of those years, he was a trustee of the society and organized talks given by society members across the country. Throughout his life, David has been involved with the charitable sector. He has served as a trustee for the Alzheimer's Society and is now vice president of the Prayer Book Society. We are very grateful to him for giving up a Saturday afternoon to talk to us. So please welcome your speaker this afternoon, David Richardson. Thank you very much, Keith, and welcome everybody. And thank you for giving up your Saturday afternoons uh, to um, consider uh, the, the writings of Jane Austen. Um, the title of my talk is Father of the Bride. And I have set myself the challenging task of arranging the fathers of the heroines of the six Austen novels in order from one to six, while resisting the temptation to cheat and make any of them third equal. The ranking will not address the question as to which of them might make the best company. Suffice it to say that if you had dinner with Sir Walter Elliot, he would no doubt call for the wine list and see that as opportunity to parade his knowledge while in fact betraying his ignorance. Were Mr Woodhouse to appear at your 21st century door, he would make it his business to check the sell-by dates of everything in your fridge or larder. The most, well, the most agreeable companion would undoubtedly be Mr Bennett, but I offer a word of warning. When it came to settling up, you would find that it was always your round. Comparisons between the Cinderella story and Pride and Prejudice may be overblown, but I'm sure that Mr. Bennett would acknowledge some pecuniary affinity to Baron Hardup. Of course, if my title had been Father of the Groom, the talk could have been much shorter and we could have all got a cup of tea much more quickly because we only meet two of the prospective fathers-in-law, General Tilney and Sir Thomas Bertram. They have one melancholy thing in common. Each of them is unforgivably rude to the respective heroine. The general, by deed, notified to Catherine by a distraught Eleanor, tomorrow morning is fixed for your leaving us and not even the hour is left to your choice. The very carriage is ordered and will be here at seven o'clock and no servant will be offered to you. The Baronet, by word. If William does come to Mansfield, I hope he may be able to convince, you may be able to convince him that the many years which have passed since you parted have not been spent on your side entirely without improvement, though I fear he must find his sister at 16 in some respects too much like his sister at 10. But something must have worked on Sir Thomas's mind while he was in Antigua. On return to Mansfield Park, one of his first questions is, where's my little Fanny? And we read that he came to have a high regard, of, a high sense of having realised a great acquisition in the promise of Fanny for a daughter. Sir Thomas, 
has a complete change of heart, that which the general undergoes is no more than a grudging change of mind. Eleanor's marriage to a Viscount throws him into a fit of good humour, from which he did not recover till after Eleanor had obtained his forgiveness of Henry and his permission for him to, to be a fool if he liked it. This is hardly the most ringing endorsement of Catherine as his daughter-in-law. You will, I hope, allow the aside that if we were to contemplate the mothers of the grooms, then an unhappy alternative lies before us between the inert and the inexcusable, Lady Bertram or Mrs. Ferrers. So we turn with relief to the fathers of the brides. In a moment, I'll look at them individually, but perhaps I might address the question as to what they have in common. They are all broadly contemporary with each other, appearing in paper within the 21, 20 year period between 1796 and 1816, and in print over the seven years between 1811 and 1818. None of the uh, six works is an historical novel, none, rare thought, is science fiction set in an imagined future or an alternative universe. They all live in the southern half of England, five of them to the west or south of London, in a line running from Somerset to Sussex through Wiltshire, Hampshire and Surrey, with Mr Bennett, the solitary northerner, comparatively speaking, up there in distant Hertfordshire. All but one of them merit the description gentleman, and the sixth could lay claim to the it could lay claim if the expression officer and gentleman were to be regarded as lifelong and indivisible. None of them occasions any surprises. None has a skeleton in the closet. None is revealed as an adulterer, bankrupt or criminal. Now, the criterion by which I will judge them is the importance of the part that they play in the respective novel. This is, I admit, personal and perhaps arbitrary, and I have no doubt that it may provoke some discussion afterwards. The father I name first is the Reverend Mr. Morland, the rector of Fullerton in Wiltshire. I regard him as the least significant of the six. That does not betoken any prejudice against him. How could anyone with my surname take against a person whose Christian name was Richard? I refuse to say first name when discussing novels written by a clergyman's daughter over 200 years ago. We never hear his voice. We learn that when the Allens invite Catherine to accompany them to Bath, Mr. and Mrs. Morland were all compliance. When Henry hastens to Fullerton, we read of Catherine's mother that, desirous of Mr. Morland's assistance, as well in giving encouragement as in finding conversation for her guest, whose embarrassment on his father's account she earnestly pitied, Mrs. Morland had very early dispatched one of the children to summon him, but Mr. Morland was from home. I wonder if this is a pure invention or whether some childhood memory may be in play of an occasion when Jane Austen's mother needed her father's assistance and the rector of Steventon was not there. All we know of Richard Morland is that he is comfortably circumstanced. He had a considerable independence besides two good livings and that he and his wife readily assented to Catherine's marriage to Henry. One might add that the most important fact about Mr Morland is that his profession is the same as Henry's. Her mother expressed the fear that Catherine would make a sad, heedless young housekeeper, to be sure. But if she did encounter problems with children or chickens or church wardens, she could at least consult her mother as a fellow clergy wife, if I may be permitted so un austin like an expression. And as Mrs Morland herself said, there's nothing like practice. General, Mil General Tilney, to bring him back into play, did Catherine an inadvertent good turn by that brutal expulsion from the Abbey. That she survived that journey home would have given her a frame of reference against which she could measure any other crisis. At least it's not as bad as the time when... 
I mention these facts because they seem to me to give Northanger Abbey a credibility it might otherwise lack. If Catherine had been untested, or if, if it had been she who became a Viscountess, it would, I submit, have, re, have ranked as no more than the most polished of the juvenilia, rather than the first of the novels. From Fullerton, we travel to Portsmouth. We had better double check our destination, because when Fanny returned to the town of her birth, it was to find that they were rattled into a narrow street leading from the high street and drawn up before the door of a small house not now inhabited by Mr. Price. Lieutenant Price has nothing to recommend him. Miss Frances married, in the common phrase, to disoblige her family, and by fixing on a lieutenant of marines without education, fortune or connections, did it very thoroughly. At the time of Fanny's move to Mansfield, he is described as disabled for active service, but not the less equal to company and good liquor. <clears throat> that characterization may obliquely remind us of the pen portrait of another and altogether more attractive Austin character, Mrs. Bates. She is described as past everything but tea and quadrille. If Catherine's father's role in Northanger may be regarded as benign absence. Then in the scenes in Mansfield Park in which he appears, Mr. Price should be seen as a malign presence. His greeting of his daughter when Sir Thomas sends her back to Portsmouth is not promising. With an acknowledgement that he'd quite forgot her, Mr. Price now received his daughter and having given her a cordial hug and observed that she was grown into a woman and he supposed would be wanting a husband soon, seemed very much inclined to forget her again. Fanny shrunk back to her seat with feelings sadly pained by his language and his smell of spirits. A few days with them shows Fanny that she could not respect her parents as she had hoped. On on her father, her confidence had not been sanguine, but he was more negligent of his family, his habits were worse, and his manners coarser. He did not want abilities, but he had no curiosity and no information beyond his profession. He read only the newspaper and the Navy list, he talked only of the dockyard, the harbour, Spithead and the mother bank. He swore and he drank, he was dirty and gross. She had never been able to recall anything approaching to tenderness in his former treatment of herself. There had remained only a general impression of roughness and loudness, and now he scarcely ever noticed her, but to make her the object of a coarse joke. There is one moment later in the novel when Mr. Price finds himself occupying the, for him, unfamiliar territory of the moral high ground when he reads in his new neighbor's newspaper of Maria Rushworth's adulterous elopement. But his subsequent comments betray what a brute he is. By God, if she belonged to me, I'd give her the rope's end as long as I could stand over her. Sir Thomas's hope that return to her father's home in Portsmouth would make Fanny more disposed to accept Crawford's offer of a marital home in Norfolk does not succeed. All that happens in this regard is that she comes to realize that it is Mansfield that has become her home. We must hurry to our next destination if we're to be in time to meet the third father. Now, you might think that I should have started at, Nor at Norland because Mrs. Dashwood's husband expires within the first three paragraphs of the novel and there are no subsequent posthumous disclosures. The novel opens with the death of Mr. Dashwood's uncle, and the facts are succinctly spelt out for us. The old gentleman died, his will was read, and like almost every, every other will, gave as much disappointment as pleasure. He was neither so unjust nor so ungrateful as to leave his estate from his nephew, but he left it to him on such terms as destroyed half the value of the bequest. 
Mr. Dashwood had wished for it more for the sake of his wife and daughters than to himself or his son, but to his son and his son's son, a child of four years old, it was secured in such a way as so as to leave to himself no power of providing for those who were most dear to him and who most needed a provision by any charge on the estate or by any sale of its valuable woods. Mr. Dashwood's disappointment was at first severe, but his temper was cheerful and sanguine, and he might reasonably hope to live many years, and by living economically, lay by a considerable sum from produce of an estate already large and capable of almost immediate improvement. But the fortune, which had been so tardy in coming, was, was his only one twelvemonth. He survived his uncle no longer, and £10,000, including his late legacies, was all that remained for his white widow and daughters. His son was sent for as soon as his danger was known, and to him Mr Dashwood recommended, with all the strength and urgency which illness could command, the interest of his mother-in-law and sisters. The scene is now set for the machinations of Fanny Dashwood. There is irony in the fact that Mr Dashwood, who is prudent and determined to make proper provision for his wife and daughters, dies before he can effect this, while Mr Bennet, who stands so light to his responsibilities, lives to find his family provided for. Three down, three to go, and we now move from those who for the most part remain in the background to the fathers to whom we are properly introduced. Sir Walter Elliot makes his presence felt straight away. His title and name provide the first three words of persuasion, and we're instantly in his company, looking over his shoulder at the baronetage. His is the only Austin family for whom we have the outlines of a family tree. We learn the birth dates of himself and his children, the name of his late wife and the date of their marriage, and the name and place and residence of his father-in-law. Uh, Sir Walter would surely feel this was no more than what was due to a family that had provided a high sheriff and an MP for three parliaments, and that had been raised to a baronetcy at the time of the restoration. But there is more to be said and less to be admired. Vanity was the beginning and the end of Sir Walter Elliot's character vanity of person and of situation. He had been remarkably handsome in his youth and at 54 was still a very fine man. Few women could think more of their personal appearance than he did, nor could the valet of any new made lord be more delighted with the place he held in society. He considered the blessing of beauty as inferior only to the blessing of a baronetcy and the Sir Walter Elliot, who united these gifts, was the constant object of his warmest respect and devotion. To call him a snob would be to lapse into severe understatement. Mr Shepherd's cajolery of Sir Walter to rent Kellynch to Admiral Croft is thrown off course by his mentioning that Mrs Croft was sister to a gentleman who did live among us once. When, when, when Anne supplies the surname, Sir Walter responds, Wentworth, oh I, Mr. Wentworth, the curate of Monkford, you misled me by the term gentleman. I thought you were speaking of some man of property. Mr. Wentworth was nobody, I remember, quite unconnected. Sir Walter is disdainful of the Navy. A man is in greater danger in the Navy of being insulted by the rise of one whose father, his father, might have disdained to speak of, and of becoming prematurely an object of disgust himself. The difference of perspective of Anne and her father is illustrated on the day when they receive an unexpected invitation from the Dowager by Countess Dalrymple. Anne was already engaged to spend that evening in Westgate buildings. So Walter was severe. Westgate buildings, said he. And who is Miss Anne Elliot to be visiting in Westgate buildings? A Mrs. Smith, a widow, Mrs. Smith. 
and who was her husband? One of the 5,000 Mr. Smiths whose names I've been met with everywhere. And what is her attraction? That she is old and sickly. Upon my word, Miss Anne Elliot, you have the most extraordinary taste. Everything that revolts other people, low company, paltry rooms, foul air, disgusting associations are inviting to you. But surely you may put off this old lady till tomorrow. She's not so near her end, I presume, that she, but that she may hope to live another day. But what really turns us against him is his inadequacy as a father for Anne. In this, he is joined by his eldest daughter, Elizabeth. His two other children were very inferior value. Mary had acquired a little artificial importance by becoming Mrs. Charles Musgrove, but Anne, with an elegance of mind and sweetness of character, which must have placed her high with any people of real understanding, was nobody with either father or sister. Her word had no weight, her convenience was always to give way. She was only Anne. It may be recalled that when it became clear that economies were needed at Kellidge, the measures that Elizabeth proposed were to cut off some unnecessary charities and to refrain from new furnishing the drawing room, to which expedients that she afterwards added the happy thought of their taking no present down to Anne uh, from the visit to London, as had been the usual yearly custom. When Anne joins them in Bath, there is half a sentence which might give hope of a change of heart. Her father and sister were glad to see her. But it continues, for the sake of showing her the house and furniture, and met her with kindness, her making a fourth when they sat down to dinner was noticed as an advantage. And while we recall that it was Lady Russell who had exercised the persuasion that gives the novel its title, we should also note that Sir Walter had played a baleful part. Sir Walter, on being applied to without actually withholding his consent or saying it should never be, gave it all the negative of great astonishment, great coldness, great silence, and a professed resolution of doing nothing for his daughter. He thought it a very degrading alliance. His extravagance and his unwillingness to make the economies that Lady Russell recommends. What? Every comfort of life knocked off, journeys, London, servants, horses, table, contractions and restrictions everywhere, to live no longer with the decencies even of a private gentleman. No, he would sooner quit Kellynch Hall at once than remain in it on such disgraceful terms. These do, of course, set in motion the events that bring Anne and Wentworth together again. I have to say that second time round, he does get it right. Sir Walter made no objection, and Elizabeth did nothing worse than look cold and unconcerned. Captain Wentworth, with five and twenty thousand pounds, and as high in his profession as merit and activity could place him, was no longer nobody. He was now esteemed quite worthy to address the daughter of a foolish spendthrift baronet, who had not had principle or sense enough to maintain himself in the situation in which Providence had placed him, and who could give his daughter at present but a small part of the share of ten thousand pounds which must be hers hereafter. But the phrase that lingers in the memory, and that damns the foolish spendthrift baronet in the eyes of the reader, is that he had no affection for Anne. There could be no more condemnatory judgment on a father than that. Well, we now have just two visits to make. Shall it be Hartfield and Highbury first, or Longbourn and Meryton? I repeat my point that I'm ranking the fathers in their order of importance within the novel in question, rather than seeking to grade them for the likely agreeableness of their company. There can be few Austin characters, whether of the first or second rank, who linger so readily in the memory as Mr. Bennett. 
we catch his unmistakable tone in the very first chapter in this conversation with his wife. In response to her, you take delight in vexing me, you have no compassion on my poor nerves. He replies, you mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. They are my old friends. I have heard you mention them with consideration these 20 years at least. Mr. Bennett does have his admirers. Consider this quotation. My father, who was serene, humorous and full of hobbies, remarked one day that he'd been asked to go on what was then called the vestry. In other words, become a church warden. At this, my mother, who was more swift, restless and generally radical in her instincts, uttered something like a cry of pain. She said, oh, Edward, don't. You'll be so respectable. We have never been respectable yet. Don't let's begin now. Now remember my father mildly replying, my dear, you present a rather alarming picture of our lives if you say that we have never to, for one single instant been respectable. Readers of Pride and Prejudice will perceive that there was something of Mr. Bennett about my father, though there was certainly nothing of Mrs. Bennett about my mother. I don't think, though, that Mr. Bennett fully merits the commendation implied in these words of the early 20th century novelist and journalist G.K. Chesterton. Because the half recalled Mr. Bennett of popular memory, the agreeable old cove given to gentle raillery is an inaccurate reflection of the Mr. Bennett of Austin's creation. He may be remembered as the equivalent of the harassed father in a TV comedy, turning to the camera with a, a, a despairing shrug of the shoulders just before a commercial break. But that is to mis misread him. Agreeable would not have been the word that Miss Austin would have used. To her, he was a mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humor, reserve and caprice. He was not old either. In the 2005 film, he is portrayed by an actor who was then aged 70. He should, however, be thought as thought of as a man, I think, in his mid 40s. 70, maybe the new 55, but it's hardly the new 46. Because had Mr. Bennett been significantly older than his wife, he would surely have noticed the absence of brain as well as the fairness of face. We, like his daughters, find Mr. Bennett a distant character. I cite one small but telling fact. There are several letters in Pride and Prejudice and echo no doubt of the fact that first impressions may well have been an epistolary novel. In most of the letters, the writer's full name is given. We learn that Mr. Gardner is Edward, that Mr. Darcy is Fitzwilliam, and even that Mr. Collins is William, but Mr. Bennett's letters end without a Christian name or even an initial. The elephant in the room in the earlier chapters of the novel is, of course, the entail. Mr. Bennett's property consisted almost entirely in an estate of 2,000 a year, which, unfortunately for his daughters, was entailed in default of heirs male on a distant relation. It's not difficult to fathom why the notion of a widow and her children losing their home on the death of a husband should direct the creative steps of the child of a parsonage. Had Mr. Austin died in office rather than in retirement, his family would have had to leave his Hampshire rectory. Mr. Bennett does not actually die, although when Lady Lucas learns that her daughter is to marry the heir to Longbourn, she began directly to calculate, with more interest than the matter had ever excited before, how many years longer Mr. Bennett was likely to live. A new reader might assume that the problem would somehow be resolved, but the uncomfortable fact is that the behaviour of Mr. Bennett does not make him worthy of the happy ending that a resolution of the entail problem would have brought. His attitude to the entail illustrates a more general irresponsibility. When first Mr. Bennett had married, economy was held to be perfectly useless, for of course, 
they were to have a son. The son was to join in cutting off the entail as soon as he should be of age, and the widow and the younger children would by that means be provided for. It would not simply have been a matter of fathering a son. That son would have had to live to the age of 21. Mr. Bennett would himself have had to live to his son's majority, for it was only he with whom the son would have been able to join in cutting off the entail. And the son would have had to be willing to accede to his parents' wishes and allow his sisters a share in his inheritance. And also the son would have needed not to have met anybody like Fanny Dashwood. Mr. Bennett is irresponsible both as husband and father. He maintains that he will not visit the new tenant of Netherfield. He had always intended to visit him, though to the last always assuring his wife that he should not go. And, and until the evening after the visit was paid, she had no knowledge of it. He gives only a few hours notice of the arrival of Mr. Collins. I hope, my dear, that you've ordered a good dinner today, even though he'd had the letter for a month and had answered it a fortnight previously. He uses the enter as a weapon in domestic strife. It is from my cousin, Mr. Collins, who, when I am dead, may turn you all out of this house as soon as he pleases. When Elizabeth pleads with her father not to let Lydia go to Brighton with the Forsters, his response is cynical. Lydia will never be easy till she has exposed herself in some public place or other, and we can never expect her to do it with so little expense and inconvenience to her family as under the present circumstances. We may need a moment to appreciate quite how shocking his attitude is. What Lydia is risking is, of course, far worse than the jealous or censorious comments of friends by phone or text to a modern teenager. You snogged him, you tart. Even when disaster has struck and he returns from his fruitless search for Lydia, flippancy gives the lie to self-reproach. No, Lizzie, let me once in my life feel how much I have been to blame. I'm not afraid of being overpowered by the impression. It will pass away soon enough. And the responsibility, which he will not accept for himself, is in the end denied him by others. Consider the following passage in the letter in which Mrs. Gardner tells Elizabeth the story of Lydia's wedding. We pick up the thread after Darcy has settled things with Wickham. Mr. Darcy's next step was to make your uncle acquainted with it and he first called in Grace Church Street the evening before I came home. But Mr. Gardner could not be seen, and Mr. Darcy found on further inquiry that your father was still with him, but would quit town the next morning. He did not judge your father to be a person whom he could so properly consult as your uncle, and therefore readily postponed seeing him till after the departure of the former. These words are not accompanied by any explanation or apology from Mrs. Gardner. They provoke no particular reaction on Elizabeth's part, and we ourselves do not normally pause in our reading. But their import is, however, clear and astonishing. Mr. Bennett is not even thought the first and most appropriate person to be given news of his errant daughter's whereabouts. He, like his wife, is allowed no reformation of character. He remains cynical to the end when he realizes that it was Darcy rather than Mr. Gardner who had rescued Lydia. He comments gleefully. And so Darcy did everything, made up the match, gave the money, paid the fellow's debts and got him his commission. So much the better. It will save me a world of trouble and economy. Had it been your uncle's doing, I must have would have paid him but these violent young lovers carry everything their own way. I shall offer to pay him tomorrow. He will rant and storm about his love for you, and there will be an end of the matter. We may smile at some of the exchanges between the Bennets. When Darcy behaves so rudely at the assembly rooms, he reports back to her husband. He is most a disagreeable, horrid man, not handsome enough to dance with, I wish you'd been there, my dear, to give him one of your set-downs. When Bingley's sisters invite Jane to dine with them at Netherfield, she asks her mother, Can I have the carriage? 
No, my dear, you'd better go on horseback because it seems likely to rain and then you must stay all night. It does rain and Jane catches a chill, prompting this remark from her husband. Well, my dear, said Mr. Bennet, if your daughter should have a dangerous fit of illness, if she should die, it would be a comfort to know that it was all in pursuit of Mr. Bingley and under your orders. But as we read, perhaps particularly as we reread the novel, it becomes clear that the background to the love matches of Jane and Bingley and of Elizabeth and Darcy is the failed and loveless marriage of Mr. and Mrs. Bennet. They did not, do not speak to each other. There is neither respect nor affection on either side. When Elizabeth states that she wishes to marry Darcy, her father, who at this point is still unaware of her change of heart and mind regarding Darcy, responds with the following bleak words. Your lively talents would place you in the greatest danger in an unequal marriage. You could scarcely escape discredit and misery. My child, let me not have the grief of seeing you unable to respect your partner in life. You know not what you are about. The Bennets are weighed in the balance and found wanting. The novel begins with a conversation between them, but it is a different couple. The good parents Elizabeth never had who are the subjects of, of its final paragraph. With the gardeners, they were always on the most intimate terms. Darcy, as well as Elizabeth, really loved them, and they were both ever sensible of the warmest gratitude towards the persons who, by bringing her into Derbyshire, had been the means of uniting them. But ultimately, it is impossible not to have some regard for him. He is, after all, Lizzie Bennet's father. Moreover, it is he who utters some of the most amusing lines ever penned by Austin. When on his first evening at Longbourn, Mr. Collins, speaking of his attendance on Lady Catherine, says, I am happy on every occasion to offer those little delicate compliments which are always acceptable to ladies, Mr. Bennet responds, may I ask whether these pleasing attentions proceed from the impulse of the moment or are the result of previous study? When he writes to Mr. Collins to inform him that Elizabeth and Darcy are engaged, he advises him, Console Lady Catherine as well as you can. But if I were you, I would stand by the nephew. He has more to give. We can be pleased to note that his affection for Elizabeth drew him oftener from home than anything else could. He delighted in going to Pemberley, especially when he was least expected. We may reflect that for the rest of the time, he was at Longbourn with only his wife and Mary for company. The man, we may feel, has suffered enough. Now, there may be disputes as to the order in which I've ranked the first five fathers, but I think it incontrovertible that Mr. Woodhouse must head the list. He is a recurring presence in, in the pages of Emma, and when he is not there, he casts a long shadow from off stage. From our first making his acquaintance on the evening of the Western wedding, poor Miss Taylor, to his eventual acquiescence in Emma's marriage, we're never far from him. In the opening sentence of the novel, we are told that Emma had had very little to distress or vex her, and the same might be said in a way of her father. He was spared many of the worries and preoccupations that beset his peers in the other novels. There was no entail in the male line to cast a shadow over the life of a father with two daughters. There were no estates in the tropics that might periodically demand his presence in person. I invite you to uh, imagine the preparations that he might have made with the assistance of Mr. Perry for a visit to Antigua. There were no tenants or stewards, no equivalent of Robert M Martin or William Larkins, needing decisions or requesting authority for outlay of capital. There was no home farm such as demanded Mr. Bennett's attention and made claim on his horses. There was no man of business such as Sir Walter's Mr. Shepherd seeking periodic audience. We never learned the source or amount of Mr. Woodhouse's income. It clearly was substantial and taken for granted, because I can only find two instances in the novel when anything remotely resembling a pound sign crosses his path. The first is early on when we're introduced to Mrs. Goddard and are told that she had formerly owed much to Mr. Bennett's kind, Mr. Wood, sorry, Mr. Woodhouse's kindness. From formerly, 
we are presumably to infer that he had loaned or given her the money to enable her to establish that real honest old-fashioned boarding school. The second occurs in chapter 21, the focus whereof is the arrival of Miss Bates at Hartfield to announce the betrothal of Mr. Elton. It is prefaced by the fact that Mr. Knightley had visited Mr. Woodhouse on business. Mr. Woodhouse had been talked into what was necessary, told that he understood, and the papers swept away. Presumably something needed repairing or diverting on the boundary between his grounds and, and Mr. Knightley's property. We learn a great deal about Mr. Woodhouse in the very first chapter of the novel. We, told, we are told that he was an affectionate, indulgent father. His sedentary way of life is exemplified by the fact that he composed himself to sleep after dinner as usual on the evening of Miss Weston's wedding. And his limitations are laid bare in these words. Emma dearly loved her father, but he was no companion for her. He could not meet her in conversation, rational or playful. The evil of their actual dispar the actual disparity in their ages, and Mr. Woodhouse had not married early, was much increased by his constitution and habits. For having been a valetudinarian all his life, without activity of mind or body, he was a much older man in ways than in years. And though everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper, his talents could not have recommended him at any time. There is a question that has to be addressed, and I'd like to phrase it in two different ways. Knowing what we know about him, how on earth were Isabella and Emma conceived? Think, or better still, try not to think about it. All that exertion and in circumstances in which Mr. Perry could hardly tell him to wrap up warm. Did he allow himself a second lightly boiled egg or an extra bowl of thin gruel? I, I turn hastily to the alternative formulation of my question. Is he a plausible character or a mere caricature? Could someone at one and the same time be an indulgent father and doting grandfather and yet be so hostile to the very idea of marriage? Matrimony, as the origin of change, was always disagreeable, and he was by no means yet reconciled to his own daughters, Isabella's, marrying, nor could ever speak of her but with compassion, though it had been entirely a match of affection. As for this more recent development, poor Miss Taylor, I wish she were here again. What a pity it is that Mr. Weston ever thought of her. Let me respond with possibly the most far-fetched comparison ever made between the world of Austin and the world of history. I doubt if anyone has ever brought together in one sentence Mr. Woodhouse, and Britain's most successful battlefield commander since Wellington, Field Marshal Viscount Montgomery of Alamein. Montgomery, like Mr. Woodhouse, married late and his wife then died young. That side of life simply came to an end for him. As the Eighth Army drove Rommel and his troops out of North Africa, Monty asked his staff over dinner one evening what they thought the officers would do when they reached Tripoli. Somebody told him. He thereupon determined that as soon as possible they would get back to the desert where there were no women. But he was not without human sympathy. When Churchill visited him in North Africa and in acknowledgement of the victory over the Africa Corps, asked him what he could do to help. Monty replied that he wanted a doubling of the mail flights from the UK so that his men could be in more frequent contact with their families. Mr. Woodhouse was not a recluse. He was fond of society in his own way. He liked very much to have his friends come and see him. And from various united causes, from his long residence at Hartfield and his good nature, from his fortune, his house and his daughter, he could command the visits of his own little circle in great measure as he liked. He had not much intercourse with any families beyond that circle. His horror of late hours and nights dinner parties made him unfit for any acquaintance but such as would visit him on his own terms. He was alert to his social obligations. He laments the fact that he's not called on Mrs. Elton. 
not to wait upon a bride is very remiss. Ah, it shows what a sad invalid I am, but I do not like that corner into Vicarage Lane. He was not inhospitable. He loved to have the cloth laid because it had been the fashion of his youth, but his conviction of suppers being very unwholesome made him rather sorry to see anything put on it, and while his hospitality would have welcomed his visitors to everything, his care for their health made him grieve that they would eat. We share his guest's relief that while Emma allowed her father to talk, she supplied her visitors in a much more satisfactory style. That he said, the sooner every party breaks up the better, I will admit. But one senses a sharp distinction in his mind between a social gathering where he would set the rules and one where guests would be subjected to the hazards of late nights, unsafe journeys, and windows thoughtlessly left open. There is a startling revelation made by Mr. Woodhouse almost as an aside in the course of the conversation that he and Isabella have as to the comparative merits of uh, South End and Chroma. I have long been perfectly convinced, so perhaps I never told you before, that the sea is very rarely of use to anybody. I'm sure it almost killed me once. The thought that he for whom the shrubbery was now the limit of his exercise had, had ever traveled so far as the coastline is astonishing. It is, I think, plausible. We can think of him as someone of less than hyperactive libido who marries late, is happily married and then loses his wife. Perhaps she caught a chill or ate something that disagreed with her. Mr. Perry would have been unable to help with a reliable diagnosis. He who had, had assured his patron when Emma had the measles, if Miss Taylor undertakes to wrap Miss Emma up, you need not have any fears, sir. He patently failed to clear any bar of medical competence, no matter how low that was set in the early 19th century. Bereavement might well have extinguished any desire on Mr. Woodhouse's part, part to venture beyond the familiar. In each of the set pieces of the novel, Mr. Woodhouse's interests have to be taken into account. For the dinner at the Westons on Christmas Eve, the hours were to be early as well as the numbers few, Mr. Woodhouse's habits and inclination being consulted in everything. When the invitation to the Coles party arrives at Hartfield, they would have solicited the honour earlier, but had been waiting the arrival of the folding screen from London which they hoped might keep Mr. Woodhouse from any draught of air and therefore induce him the more readily to give them the honour of his company. He declines. I'm not fond of dinner visiting. I never was. No more is Emma. Late hours do not agree with us. I'm sorry Mr. and Mrs. Cole should have done it. He is only reconciled to his daughter's spending a whole evening away from him by the fact that Mrs. Goddard is to come and play piquet with him. For the ball at the Crown, it is Mrs. Bates who is engaged to spend the evening with him. I will let her daughter remind us what happened. There was a little disappointment. The baked apples and biscuits, excellent in their way, you know, but there was a delicate fricassee of sweetbread and some asparagus brought in at first. And good Mr. Woodhouse, not thinking the asparagus quite boiled enough, sent it all out again. The visit to Donwell Abbey is the first time that Mr. Woodhouse has ventured from his own house and the walk to the shrubbery since the Christmas dinner at Randall's six months earlier. Under a bright midday sun at almost midsummer, Mr. Woodhouse was safely conveyed in his carriage with one window down to partake of this alfresco party and in one of the most comfortable rooms in the Abbey, especially prepared for him by a fire all the morning, he was happily placed, quite at his ease, ready to talk with pleasure of what had been achieved and advise everybody to come and sit down and not to eat themselves. Mrs. Weston, who seemed to have walked there on purpose to be tired and sit all the time with him, remained, when all the others were invited or persuaded out, his patient listener and sympathiser. The following day, Mrs. Weston remains with Mr. Woodhouse. And I sense that her absence from Box Hill would help create, helps to create the conditions for the high drama of the expedition. She would have found the words to lower the temperature when her husband's frankly dotty indulgence of Emma, 
what two letters of the alphabet are there that express perfection that sets in train the flirtatious conversation between Frank and Emma, which brings Jane Fairfax to breaking point. Moreover, Emma might not have been quite so rude to Miss Bates in the presence of her former governess, and her words of reproof would in any event have been milder than Mr Knightley's. How could you be so insolent in your wit to a woman of her character, age and situation? There is one more ironic twist to the novel. Mr Woodhouse's first response to the news that Emma wishes to marry and that Mr Knightley will come to live at Hartfield is to say that he should be glad to see him every day. But they did see him every day as it was. Why could they not go on as they had before? In time, he is reconciled to the idea. It was agreed on as to what it was to be, and everybody by whom he was used to be being guided, assuring him that it would be for his happiness, and having some feelings himself which might almost admitted it, he began to think that some time or other, in another year or two perhaps, it might not be so very bad if the marriage did take place. But then he asserts, but then he assent, not by any sudden illumination of Mr Woodhouse's mind or any wonderful change of his nervous system. The fears induced by the robbing of his neighbours' poultry houses and the fact that John Knightley and his family needed to be back in London by early November mean, meant that, with a much more voluntary cheerful consent than his daughter had ever presumed to hope for at the moment, she was able to fix her wedding day for October. In other words, Mr Woodhouse is the only father who asks that the wedding be brought forward. Let me offer some concluding thoughts. It is perhaps a tribute to the range of Austin's imagination that only, that only in one of the novels, and that the one least well regarded, the father of the bride is a clergyman, and one might add the aside that by the time we get to persuasion, the clergy have no more part to play than as part of the backstory. The young Wentworth having been visiting his brother, the curate of Monkford, and of the subplot involving Henrietta and her cousin Charles Hayter, with his expectations of something from the bishop in a year or two. It is a further tribute and a rejoinder to the, to the canard that she wrote the same story six times, that the fathers are so different from each other. Lieutenant Price and Sir Walter so self-absorbed, Mr Dashwood and in his own way Mr Woodhouse so concerned for others, Mr Bennett so anxious for solitude, and Mr Woodhouse unable to be on his own. The final thought requires a word of explanation. In 2017, I had the privilege of delivering a talk that I had prepared for the anniversary. Jane Austen, 200 not out. On one occasion, a lady came up to me afterwards and said, I'm surprised that a man should take such an interest in Jane Austen. She thought you lot were weak. I was so taken aback that I couldn't think what to say. And that may, of course, have strengthened my interlocutor in the view that she had imputed to Miss Austen but I'm in some small measure grateful for the challenge because I must admit that in all six novels, it is masculine frailty that provides the framework or is the precipitant for the unfolding of the story. You might question this for Northanger Abbey, and I will allow that it is not the father who is in play here, but it is to be recalled that it was Mr. Allen's gout that prompted the visit to Bath. Mr. Price's inability to provide for his family or to do anything other than that which increases their number makes necessary Fanny's move to Mansfield Park. It is the untimely death of Mr. Dashwood, compounded by the malleability of his son at the hands of his daughter-in-law, which casts his widow and her daughters adrift from Norland. Sir Walter Elliot's failure to manage his estate properly sets the scene for the return of Wentworth. Mr. Bennett's failure to live prudently gives urgency to his wife's search for sons-in-law. And as we've just heard, all of Emma revolves around Mr. Woodhouse and his needs. But let me allow one of the fathers the last word. You know which one I'm going to choose because I identified him at the start as providing the best company. You are welcome to join in the punchline. Your mother, 
will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That was absolutely delightful and fascinating and just thoroughly enjoyable. Um, and I'm sure that people will have some wonderful questions. We can do a, a uh, question and answer period now. You can either um, raise your hand and ask to be unmuted and have your video on to ask the question, or if you're a bit more shy than that, you can type a question into the, into the chat function. There we are. Would any of the fathers be equipped to uh, live in the current age? Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh. I've, <laughs> I, 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 I really don't, I really don't know. I mean, I, I, I suppose I, I can imagine, uh, I, I can imagine Miss, Mr. Moreland as a as as a country parson, although of course in these days you probably have about twelve churches to to run rather than one. Thank you. Michael, do you have a question? Oh, you're still muted. Jane's own father was probably uh, as good a model as you could expect. Yes, yes, and um, and and one could say that the the the, the most the most sympathetic, in a way, the most sympathetic portrait, or the the least critical portrait of a father, is of um, of Catherine's father. In uh, in North Anger Abbey, um, who, who is as, as as we were saying is is the father closest to George Austin. Yeah. Could can I throw a question out, Keith? Um, of course. Would anyone want to take issue with my with, with my ranking um, in in order of importance? I mean, beginning with uh, Mr. Morland as the least important in the context of the particular novel, and and ending with um, Mr. Woodhouse as the most important. I think it's because he is by far the most amusing and it is his comments that we remember most. You can't hear me. Yeah, sorry, yes. were, were, you, were you speaking of, um, of, of Ms. Mr. Yeah. Bennett? Or... I was speaking of Mr. Bennett. Yes, yes. His um... comments are sufficiently amusing to they stay are. in one's mind, I think, longer than anything else of I, the I, fathers. I, uh, because the but... snob, um, Sir Walter, is yeah. just overpainted in a sense, and therefore he doesn't register in the same way. No, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, I mean it, 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 it would be an interesting exercise to as it were, rank them in a slightly different way, and, and, and you, even more subjective would be, how good were they as fathers? Well, I think um, what's interesting about, about Mr. Woodhouse is, is Emma's affection towards him because she's painted as being so terribly selfish, and yet she's always kind to her father. And I think that sets it apart a little bit as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
Oh, no, I mean, as, to, to, at the end, when um, when she and Knightley are to marry, there is no suggestion at any time that, that they would, would even try to override his wishes. That's right. Um, if had had one gets the very clear sense that had he said no, you've got to wait three years, they would have waited. Um, On the other, and I don't. None of the other fathers have that kind of command of everyone. No. 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 I mean, I, I mean, it, it. In its in a sense, Mr. Woodhouse is so, as it were. Um, I can't think quite of the word, but in in in, in terms of his circumstances, he he is uh, me. He he is he is comfortably off. Mm. Um, in the terms of his, his his position in the village community, his house, his income, it it is only as an individual that he is so totally insecure and so frightened of. Of, of of drafts and the corner into Vicarage Lane, and um, and the cold and mm. uh, and what he might or might not eat. And, um, but no one ridicules him for that. No, 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 no. I mean that there is a, as it were, a, a decency of character there mm -hmm. that no 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 one can. That can really object to. And it's also the window we have into Emma that we realize she can grow into a better person because yeah. of the way she treats her father. Yes. Yes. There, there is there is an issue that I, that I, I have with it, with with the novel, um, in, in the and, and this is a controversial view and. and I think there are many people who don't agree with me on this. I don't really find Emma convincing as a love story. Hmm. Um, in in that, um, it, it, it there, there is that line that it sort of darted through with the speed of an arrow that Mister Knightley should marry nobody but her. Um, it and one could argue that. I mean, having lived with an old father, she is now now going to marry another old man. Mm -hmm. Given that um, she is what twenty one, and uh, Knightley is, I think, thirty seven. There is that so huge, mm -hmm. huge disparity in in age uh, b between them. Um, but as I say, that that is, that is perhaps a minority view. Um, Are you ready? I think Betty's question is: um, uh, Can you hear me? By the way. Yes. Yes. Betty's question is a very good one. I was thinking on during your talk. I was thinking a lot about uh, the very different circumstances now. Um, that uh, exist to uh, 200 years ago. Um, and on the one hand, personal relationships, uh, that doesn't change, the sort of personal relationships, but it's interesting the comparisons with economic well being and responsibilities of fathers there, and indeed their abilities to deliver on that or, or limitations there. Whether being a father nowadays is going to be more difficult um, than it was then, you know, I think this is really quite an interesting topic when we're looking at society as it as it is with, with two hundred years difference, and it's it, the, the circumstances are so different. And those were the comparisons I was thinking about when you were talking, and I think I think that. Um, the point about Betty's question, if I can put words in her mouth, was, you know, to a to an extent, they were a pretty dismal lot, <laughs> and um, whether they would cope better or or worse today, um, 
is a good question, but uh, you know, in terms of the responsibilities uh, of fathers and the assessment of fathers today in the two different ages, you know, it's quite an important sort of basis on which to look at it, I think. Um, and I mean, they, they, they are all, one could say that they are, they, they are all flawed in one way or another, apart perhaps from Catherine's father, whom of course we never really meet. Um, I mean, the, the um, inadequacies of Mr. Bennett are, are well, well documented, although, you know, he, he would be the, the most agreeable company. Um, Mr. Woodhouse was, would be somewhat irksome company, particularly if one was hungry and wanted with the fricassee and the, and the asparagus. Um, and, and Sir Walter was a dreadful father. Um, and as I said towards the end, it, it was the uh, masculine frailty is the precipitant for, for, in a way, for each of the stories. Or is either the precipitant or or a key background factor. Um, but, uh, okay. And I just. Joan, you're muted. Jo Joan is speaking, but she's muted. Hmm. Joan, we can't. Joan, you're muted. We can't hear you. Joan, you're muted. Can you unmute her, Keith? No. No, you can't. I don't think she can hear us. No. I've I've sent her a message to unmute. Ah, oh, thank you. But uh, she it looks like she's searching. She's gonna have to go over it all again. <laughs> Can I just ask if anyone else has has a question? Help. Is that there helping? Is. Now it we've is. got yes. you. There you are. Right. Yes. Well, it's simply the fact, of course, that men predominated. They they absolutely decided almost everything in life at that time. The women had very, very little authority, unless, like Sir Lady Catherine, they had a fortune and they were a widow. Widows were very important if they had a sufficient money they could really determine a great many things but it in on the whole men controlled the whole field of operation that's absolutely true maybe maybe her, jane austen's portrayal of these men was her her feminism coming through <laughs> yes yeah. indeed <laughs> yes i think so yeah. Yes, the, the, we the, have the a other, question. The other, uh, oh. the, other well, the other independent and wealthy woman is uh, Mrs. Jennings. Yes. A widow with an ample venture. Yes. yes. Um, we have a question in the chat function, somebody who would prefer to do it this way. And her question is, how far do we believe Austen's father characters are inspired by her own father or male relations? And how far did she simply take traits from the ideals of Georgian fatherhood, pride, comma, disinterest in women's affairs, etc., and create characters based on those ideals so that she could deconstruct them in her usual brilliant fashion? I, mean, I, I, I would be inclined more to the second than the first interpretation that that the I, I think the fact that they're all that there are so many differences between them mm. um i mean points seems to me to point to 
the, the fact that she, she like like all of us, I mean, she 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 could only be contemporary with herself. I mean, she 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 used the materials that were to hand, but her genius was to take that which she knew, that which she'd experienced, that which she uh, had observed, Absolutely. and to fashion um, characters who are who are believable not all of them likable but but are believable um i mean the the, the the fact that um she could create characters as distinct as as different from each other as as mr woodhouse is so so kindly disposed to to um other people albeit on his own terms and mrs norris whom one critic has described as the most plausible most plausibly odious woman in english fiction <laughs> which i think is absolutely correct <laughs> um uh i mean the, the the range is the range is 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 is, is astonishing um and uh the perhaps one one, one of the greatest uh, tributes to or, or i just tribute most powerful in indication of the scope of austin's imagination lies not in any of the six novels that we enjoy and quote from but in that novella lady lady susan that a vicar's a rector's daughter in her late teens should write a novel about the adventures of a middle-aged adulteress. Um, uh, it, 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 well, where did that come from? <laughs> um, uh, um, I, I think one of the problems has been in perhaps until recently, that people have tended to think of um, Jane Austen as a sort of pre-Victorian prude in some ways, which is absolutely not, <laughs> not, not true. I mean, that she was very much a, a child of, of her own age. I mean, um, a, a writer in the Georgian age and a published author of the Regency age. Um, but um but the but 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 I, I say, I say, one can say that the tribute to her is the fact that we all love her novels and we read them and reread them more than 200 years after her death and there is a freshness to them and you know one always finds something new in them every time you you you, you look at them and and that that, that surely is 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 the mark of genius um that 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 you that you never get to the end of of saying well i understand it and that's it and i don't really to, need to read austin again no one ever gets to that stage even though we may know the stories almost backwards but um could i um could i offer something else very brief um, perhaps as we as we come to um, a conclusion, if I may, uh, a few years ago, the Jane Austen Society ran a competition in its newsletter in which people were invited to um, uh, write a piece in which a character from another work of fiction was introduced into an Austen novel. Uh, I I am. Um, submitted an entry which i have here um and uh, the speaker is miss bates it was most kind of you dear mrs weston and miss smith to visit my mother and jane while i was in london yesterday mr cole took me in his carriage so very obliging to see a friend of mr john knightley his friend has quite the air of mr frank churchill Mamma did not hear his name the first time, so I had to repeat it, not that she is deaf. The name's Bond, James Bond, I told her. 
I am to travel to, to Paris with him as my chaperone and be introduced to Napoleon. And Mr. <laughs> Bond says that after an hour of listening to me, Boney will forget about invasion and lose the will to live. And I am licensed to bore for England. What will Miss Woodhouse say? It is a great honor and a secret and do please have a baked apple. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think that's a perfect way to end for today. That was wonderful. Um, I just want to mention one more thing that this uh, session has been recorded. And in about a month's time, uh, it will be available to be viewed uh, on the website for the BRLSI. So uh, if you want to check back, if you want to watch it again, or if you want to recommend it to any friends to watch, it will be available uh, in about a month. All right. So again, thank you, Richard. It was just an absolutely wonderful, uh, wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to hear your insights and uh, uh, just very, very refreshing. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. all right.